Hello! Welcome to the AuthorTube Writing Conference, Sunday, noon edition. Uh, we are doing the presentation of writing that sucks your readers in, writing descriptions. I could do this. Okay, so to make sure that I squished everything down in time, I pre-recorded it. So I'm going to play it, but I will be here to answer your questions after the recording. So mark your questions with a cue. And let's get started. Uh, this one. Welcome to writing descriptions that suck your reader in. Uh, this is July 17th at noon Eastern for the AuthorTube Writing Conference. Let's get started. So first off, who am I? My name is Laura Nettles. I was born in California, but moved up here to Toronto, Canada for my day job. I light special effects for film and television by day, and I pen terrors by night. I have 14 Drabbles Flash short stories accepted or already published. I'm currently querying a middle grade horror novel. I have a podcast called Twisted Tendrils Horrific Writing Advice, available where most pad podcasts are. And I have a dog, and his name is Roy Edward Nettles. If you hear him and his squeaky toy, I'm sorry he's adorable so a disclaimer if you do not see an attribution of who wrote the piece in the slides it was me so i wrote most of these examples all right so subtopics the five senses environment affecting the character filtering through the lens of the character describing the emotions impact on the character's body and mind Anthropomorphism, personification, metaphor, simile, and juxtaposition. Uh, how to break cliches, so cliche phrases in your descriptions. And limiting descriptions depending on story length. So let's dive right into the first topic, which is the five senses. Sight, smell, sound, touch, and taste. The extended senses can include temperature, time, vestibular, which is tilt or balance, pain, High grow reception, like the rain is coming. Proprioception, close your eyes, touch your nose, that type of exercise. And there are many more, but we're just going to focus on the first five. So the first one is sight. What can a character see? Do certain things stand out to a character? Were they never able to see color before? Have they never seen in person a sky full of cloud-piercing skyscrapers? If so, they would probably focus on it a lot longer than somebody who is native to the city. Describe the lighting, colors, and shadows. Don't rely only on sight in your descriptions. This is the most common one used, but mix it up to pull us in with multiple senses. So here's the example number one for sight. This is from my piece called The Color of Salt. She had never noticed the color of salt before, or rather, its color-bending properties, like blotched watercolor, only more fractal in its drawing of the tints and hues into itself, becoming whatever was around it, invisible except for its unnatural, uncanny qualities. A face not quite right, eyes bleeding into the skin tones around them, then sucked back into the pinpricks of salty pupils. So we have not just color, but also texture of color, like blotched watercolor, and when you put salt on watercolor and how it makes it more fractal and blotchy, really fun. From my piece, Transfigured Memory, this is example number two. My own eyes melted and reformed, rewired, transfigured. Alien colors became visible, a miasma of beauty surrounding this unknowable creature. Ultraviolets, infrareds, and an assortment of others shimmered and bubbled, engulfing me. I was inhaling purples and exhaling radar. So I wanted to expand the frequency range that my character could observe when they were reformed by this cosmic monster creature. So I am going into the ultraviolets and the radars 
and trying to get them more into a color and a sight. So sight, it can be fun to describe shards of light slashing across someone's face, revealing their eyes, or bars of light raking across the bed from a window, making the character feel like they are in a prison. Show glints of light off the teeth of monsters, keeping other parts of it in shadow so the reader can be afraid of the unknown as well as the revealed danger. Uh, example number three. This is from The Colors. That wasn't the worst of it. Since they moved in, the colors of shadows had changed. No longer were they a deep navy at all times, but shifted to maroons, glowing ambers, and the pale lilac of dead lips. Example number four. Orange haze engulfs me as the towers of the abandoned city of cathedrals winks on the horizon. My final resting place. My tomb of splendor. So, use stronger words to describe what the characters see. Words that evoke the emotion the character is feeling. Is it the soothing purple of soft baby blankets? Or the pale lilac of dead lips? Use interesting verbs to describe what the character is taking in. The cathedral winks on the horizon. I could also use glints or flickers, but wanted a more human word, especially since these cathedrals are made of uh, like organic tissue. So fun times. When describing a character, it's helpful to have a distinguishing feature that other characters and reader can differentiate them by. Don't always refer to them by that feature in dialogue tags though. The ginger-haired man. Sporadically sure, but names are definitely helpful. Also, vary the descriptions. It's not emerald orbs every time when you describe the love interest eyes. Here is example number five from my piece, The Old Woman. Her ancient eyes burn red, sunken within the deep recesses of their sockets. The folds of her crow's feet are vast canyons carved by the trickling streams of tears over time. They catch and cast shadows as dark as her bottomless pupils. Her long, bulbous nose continues to grow while her muscles decay, stark bones now cutting at the skin from the inside. So this one, I used a painting as a prompt, but also mixed in the image from the Boris Karloff version of The Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, from way back in like the 30s, where Dr. Pretorius is an older man and he has these crow's feet and the flashing lights when they are bringing the bride to life, they just exacerbate the depths of these dark wrinkles and they were so beautiful. And so I utilized the painting and Dr. Pretorius and mushed them together and I got this old woman. All right, the next sense is smell. What can a character smell? Is the smell new to the character? You may have to describe it in a roundabout way using similar smells they do know, especially if the smell is not known to Earth. Scents are connected to memories and can trigger callbacks. So there are wires in the brain that can cross with scents and memories. It's really cool. So contrasting scents to describe the same location or character can also be fun to utilize. So here is example number one for smell uh, from American Gods by Neil Gaiman. The house smelled musty and damp and a little sweet, as if it were haunted by the ghosts of long dead cookies. I absolutely love this one. So we have musty and damp and ghosts and long dead but juxtaposed with sweet and cookies. And it's just so evocative. I love it. Here's from my piece, The Witch's Purge. Her scream shred her throat, the smoke burning the open wounds as the flames licked hungrily around her. The smell of burnt hair and charred meat filled the town square, sweet and terrible. So cooking meat, it can smell sweet, but it's human, so obviously... It's not that appetizing. All right. So this is example number three for smell from my piece, The Perfume Lingers. And this one was an experiment to see if I could evoke the sense that this is an abusive relationship just by using the five senses. So the sense that I focused on was smell. The smell of her perfume lingers in the air. 
I ran to the window, throwing open the curtains, revealing the spectacular view of Lyon, France. My fingers slice open on the metal latches, keeping the fresh air out and memories in. I take a deep breath, trying to steady myself. The scent sends my brain into a whirlpool of history I had wrestled away into locked boxes in the darkest, deepest abysses of my mind. They have been freed by air alone, a whisper of her presence, the suspended particles talons in my soul. So smells could be a great way to invoke atmosphere. A musty haunted house where moldering food was left on the table to rot alongside the dead inhabitants. Or freshly laundered linen curtains flowing in the salty breeze of an open window of a beach house. Or rich spices of the haggling food vendors in an open air bazaar on a distant planet, the lingering perfume of a villain. Sound. Sound can be described or written out as onomatopoeia. Think bam, pow, oof from the 1960s Adam West Burt Ward Batman TV show, which I grew up on. It's great. Highly recommend. Or it could be animal sounds like crows and cats and stuff. So be careful of filtering. She heard a branch crack to her left is filtering with she heard. We are watching her here. We are not hearing it with her. So versus a branch crack to her left. We are there with her and a branch cracks. Or you could go all the way with onomatopoeia. Crack. A branch snapped to her left. So we hear that crack and are not just next to her, but hear it ourselves in the reading sense. So it can be fun also to use it as mirrors. So open and close with the same sound, but now we feel differently about it. I have a really short piece called Imaginary Friend where a ghost is assigned to be a friend to a kid. And we start with the clink of the teacups for their little imaginary tea party. And the kid starts growing up, is about to go to school, and then tragedy befalls the kid and the kid dies. And so the person is assigned the next kid to be the imaginary friend to. And we end with the clink of the teacups with the new kid. So... Now we're depressed about that sound, even though it's cute. It's just depressing. Also, the ticking of a clock the character can hear can add tension to a scene. So here's an example one from my piece, Skeleton Man. Without waiting for a reply, his ancient form moves, creaks, scrapes forward around the beating altar where the heart of the city is laid bare. Inch by inch, he scritches closer as my limbs grow numb. So here we have sound words like creaks and scrapes and scritches. And a lot of these have the hard C sounds also that make it so that the reader, when they read it aloud, can hear the sound as well. They're not outright onomatopoeias. So the consonants of starting with that same sound can be more visceral and make you feel it. Example number two for sound. My voice echoes back, distorted, warped. It sounds like thousands of different people calling at once, voices coalescing. There is no response. That was from Somnambulist Waking, and from my untitled gothic vampire piece. Run, run. The murder of crows croak out the words with inhuman tongues, syllables rasping past lipless beaks. So I think This is actually dialogue and not onomatopoeia, but we have the crows croaking and um, we have it rasping. So these evocative verbs that have more sound qualities. And here's from my piece, Rust. My eye looked down the sight of the barrel. Humans would not go down quietly. I took a breath and aimed between my heartbeats. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Bang! Thump, thump. The bullet's aim was true. Purple blood spurted into the air as the tall creature giving slithering orders toppled to the bed of the craft. One down. So for this one, we have a trained sniper that is aiming in time with his heart's actual heartbeat. So I want us to be able to feel that, so I actually wrote out the beating of his heart. Here is an example with lots of onomatopoeia. 
So this is in my piece, Last Photograph, which is about a seance in a gothic house. Tick, tick, tick. Jack's pocket watch kept him aware of the slow passage of empty time. Time where nothing unexplained happened. Time to get paid to do nothing but sit and stare. Ring, ring. Fear crashed up Jack's spine. It was really happening. Flash. He took a picture of the ornate silver bell upon the table, wishing he could capture sound as well. Jack couldn't tell if it was levitating or not. Would have to wait till after he developed the photos. Flash. A bubbling stream of ectoplasm oozed from Mrs. Blackwell's mouth through her mesh veil to hang in midair over the center of the table. Flash. The torso of a man in uniform coalesced from the viscous black substance, his pale eyes wide and mouth twisted in a dying scream. Whoosh. Complete darkness. The candles whipping into extinction. Jack gripped his grandmother's crucifix in his pocket and prayed to her, his patron saint. Was she still here with him? So we had the ticking of the clock, the ringing of the bell, the flashing of the flashbulbs, the whooshing of the candles. And because it is starting each paragraph with it, I'm building up a rhythm and these little tiny moments of time that are being captured on the photos. So we're getting little vignettes. All right, the next sense is touch. Touch can be described through texture, temperature, weight, etc. Describe the touch through the lens of the character. Do they perceive the touch as soothing or off-putting? Maybe it's deceiving. Juxtaposition can be powerful. Small, almost weightless things like pills can have monumental impact on the character's life. Do terrible things feel nice or sensual? So example number one from my little piece called Pet Pill. You look to the pink and green pills in the palm of your hand. Their small weight feels deceiving. Bottoms up. Example number two from Somnambulist Waking. Her sheets are satin, like her nightgown. I run my fingers over them before giving in to my desire to be seen and slide into her welcoming embrace. So we have the consonants of sheets and satin and slide, but together we can feel the smoothness of them even though it's not outright stated, it's with these S's and the satin, and we're running our fingers over them that we get the sense of touch. Example number three from last photograph. The beginning this time. The ornate double doors came into view as the pathway turned a corner. Large and white, they exuded cold as if carved from an iceberg magically held in stasis. They chilled his knuckles as he rapped quickly on their newly repainted surface, the knocks reverberating into the house beyond. This one actually was from a flash fiction prompt that made me have to use the word iceberg. So it's like, I'll just use it in a touch uh, sense. So there we go. All right, so the same action or touch can be described differently based on the mental state of the character being affected. Is the finger sliding along a naked back welcome and sensual, or that of a captor? Use words that clue us in on the character's feelings. The next sense is taste. Taste can be described literally or abstract. It's one of the lesser-used senses. What does the character taste in the air? Brimstone? Ash? Powdered, colorful chalk? What do they taste when face down in the dirt? Or when actually eating food? What does their own mouth taste like? After hot chocolate, a rare steak, or a kiss. So here are some examples from other authors. So example one is from Sasha Black in The Anatomy of Prose. And she says, have you ever been so angry your mouth dries and tastes poisonous? I love this idea that your mouth dries from your words because your words are so poisonous that your mouth becomes poisonous. Just, yes. Spitting venom. So good. Example number two. This is from Radiance by Catherine M. Valenti. It tasted like a shade of white near blue. It tasted like the idea of pearls. It tasted like a memory nearly grasped but lost at the last moment. So this one is more abstract, but I thought it was beautiful, so I included it. And from My Naughty Little Sister by Dorothy Edwards. Presently, my little sister began to wonder if the ring would taste as sparkly as it looked. It was sparklier than fizzy lemonade. So, of course, she put the ring in her mouth. And, of course, it didn't taste like lemonade at all. 
great use of making us see things through the eyes of the little sister with correlating things like sparkly with carbonation. So, ah, just well done. All right, mix up the senses. I like to use about three senses at a time in my descriptions. Mix it up. Sight, sound, and taste, or touch, sound, and smell, etc. You don't need to go overboard and use all five at the same time all the time. Then your descriptions could pull the reader from what's going on. Don't make your descriptions so long the reader forgets to care. Example number one from my Drabble Scarecrow. Wind whips through my tattered crow pick shirt, swirling the scents of rotten corn and spilt blood. The shrieking squeals of the now slaughtered pigs echo through my straw stuffed head. So, aside from all the alliterations, we have the feel of crow picked. We have the sound of whipping wind and squealing slaughtered pigs. We have the scent of rotten corn and blood. In my next example from Carbogen, uh, I say, she watched as Dr. Johnson started the camera to record the session, tiny red light glowing next to the lens, and approached her. The doctor's polished left shoe squeaked against the linoleum flooring. His lab coat fluttered slightly from the cool air conditioning. She wished she could fly away, use his coat as wings to flap and flutter out the third story window behind her. So, we can see the little red light. We can hear the left shoe squeak. We can kind of see and hear the fluttering of a lab coat. And with the alliteration, we can hear the prose with fly and flap and flutter. And it seems a little bit like the flapping of a bird's wing. All right, so the environment. Describe how the environment interacts with the character. Don't describe things that are off in the distance. The character themselves would not really pay attention to. This is so important. If your character is held at gunpoint, they are not thinking, oh, I think that's an owl, like three streets away that is hooting off in the distance somewhere out there. No. They are focusing on the senses of the smell of the rancid breath of the person holding them at gunpoint, of the body odor oozing through the clothing. They are focused on the glint of the streetlight off of the attacker's glasses. They are focused on what is relevant to the situation. Don't pull our focus away from what's important. So you don't need to go into history info dumps every time you describe a new location. Some details may be helpful, but not multiple paragraphs or pages. You need to hook the reader. So here is example number one. Dust plumed around my booted foot as I took my first step into Twisted Gulch. The ghostly voices of the inhabitants who fled darted between the rickety wooden buildings, causing goosebumps to ripple across my bare, sunburnt arms. Sand suspended in the rasping air tarnished my best-dressed tan, eating its way into the delicate lace. Are there the ashes of the mysteriously departed mixed in? I breathe as quietly and shallowly as possible, creeping my way forward to the first derelict home. So, we have the environment physically interacting with the character. We have dust pluming around the feet. We have sand eating into the lace on her dress. We have her uh, changing her breathing because she doesn't know if the ashes of the missing people are in the air. We can feel the sunburnt arms. Things like that can definitely help bring a story to life and add more atmosphere. Example number two. This one is from my piece Skeleton Man. My feet drag along the dirt road, sharp rocks tearing at my translucent skin. The river of the recently discovered color red trailed in my heel's wake, the smell enough to make my stomach roil. A clear way for the dogs to track me down, if they should even make it this far into the desolate realm. Orange haze engulfs me as the towers of the abandoned city of cathedrals winks on the horizon, my final resting place, my tomb of splendor. Between the rugged cracks of the baked, forsaken land, pulsing veins pull lifeblood towards the city even death could not kill. Veins that bulge crimson and thick, the only sign of life within miles. So here we're weaving in a little bit of history, like the city that death could not kill. We are focusing on some colors, 
because he has gained that ability. So now we have the reds and the oranges and the crimsons. Uh, we have a cathedral winking on the horizon. So that is his trajectory where he's going, which is why he notices it, because that's where he wants to go. Not just because it's off in the distance. On to the next one. Character lens. Don't describe things that are off in the distance the character themselves would not really pay attention to. Don't waste your words. Use adjectives and verbs the character would use to describe situations and things. So, is the character a fashion designer who first notices the cut, colors, and textures of clothing, then will take in the character's face and state of emotion after, but only if they deem them worthy of attention? Characters of different ages have different vocabularies. So when I have child protagonists, I try to change my vocabulary to be more of the grade level of what that kid would be. There is a difference between character voice and narrator voice. Is your story being told through a narrator that is older than the main character? Or is this first person through a six-year-old's eyes? Keep the character voice consistent. A character's voice reveals their personality. So, emotions affect the character. A great resource for this is the Emotion Thesaurus. I have the second edition. I've linked it in the description box. Describe how the emotions affect your character's body. Slick palms, racing heart, nausea, wringing their hands, strangled cry of frustration, pulling at their own hair, mirroring the posture of who they are speaking to, etc. Don't just label the emotions. Sometimes people say show don't tell, so don't label the emotions at all. But sometimes I find labeling can be helpful, especially when you are on a tight word count. Keep fears consistent. If you describe them being afraid of heights, it should affect all aspects of their life. Don't just do it once to make a scene dramatic. Make it matter consistently. All right, we are on to some techniques to use in your descriptions. First up is anthropomorphism, one of my favorites. So it is the attribution of human characteristics or behaviors to an animal, object, or a god, literally. Animals and objects don't just seem to stare at you with disdain. They may have actual eyes that dart about, or a mouth to be able to vocalize their feelings. Think Thomas the Tank Engine or Tigger. A monster could be anthropomorphic. Think Monster House, the movie from 2006, where the house is literally alive, devouring the children who enter, grief and anger made physical. So it can be great to use when describing a mental breakdown, a la Evil Dead 2 from 1987, with the deer head on the wall laughing while Ash is mentally overwhelmed. Ghosts can be the anthropomorphic representations of certain emotions. Regret, loss, revenge. There's also the writers of the apocalypse, representing pestilence, war, famine, and death, literally wielding them and named after them. Here's an example of anthropomorphism. Ryan rubbed his bleary eyes strained by the candlelight. Cast shadows danced on the ornate moth pattern on the wallpaper. He wearily stared at the designs on the backs of the painted wings. The wings stared back. Hidden eyes sprang forward, revealing themselves through the gold and filigree, staring unblinkingly into his own terrified eyes. Ryan jumped back, palms sweating, sluggish heart now racing. Then he blinked, and they were gone. The wings were just paint and gold once more. A sister to anthropomorphism is personification. So this one is the attribution of a personal nature or human characteristic to something non-human or the representation of an abstract quality in human form, figuratively this time. Shadows stretching out with long, sinister fingers towards your hallowed sanctuary are really shadows that are just growing longer from the sun dipping on the horizon, right? It's a great way to work in atmosphere by giving the environment itself feelings, thoughts, emotions, intentions. So here are three examples. Number one, the mountain peak looms over the climbers, evaluating if the puny humans were up to the challenge of conquering it. Example two, a room breathes. Example three, 
The tattered curtains and peeling wallpaper made the home look homeless. Example four. Gusts of wind scream around the brickwork of the house. Example five. Stars hurl themselves into the ocean depths. So the attribution of human characteristics to inanimate objects can help a reader sympathize with the situation, can help them see a parallel to their own existence. It gives the environment more character. And on to metaphor. A figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable, a.k.a. say something is something else. It's a comparison that makes you look at something in a different light. A word of warning, though. Don't go so abstract that you go purple prose where the reader must squint through their innate filigree adorning every word, not sure what you mean on first or second read through. If it breaks the reader's flow, maybe forgo it. So here are three examples of metaphor. The child was a demon, raising hell with banshee screams. The moon was a lantern, a beacon in the inky starless sky. The cracked floor was shattered dreams, shards of hope crushed beneath his heel. And on to simile. Something is like or as another thing, not actually the random object of comparison. It can be weaker than a metaphor since it's only theoretical but it's valuable all the same. It helps the reader to paint more vivid pictures in their mind. Comparing things that are seemingly weak to things that are traditionally strong can be a great way to flip a situation on its head. So here are four similes. Weak as water. Dense as a brick. The jack-o'-lantern glowed like a thousand fireflies. The granny swung her purse like a lumberjack wielding their axe. And on to juxtaposition. Placing two things that seem at odds with each other in the same description for comparison or contrast, like the lumberjack-esque granny. Usually you make a micro juxtaposition through similes or metaphors, but there can also be big picture or macro juxtapositions as well. The main character's thought process, fighting skills, etc., from the beginning of the book versus the end. So here's example one. Her satin skin and lace freckles concealed her dagger tongue. Example two. The weightlifter's thick fingers danced with grace, piping the delicate whipped frosting into the mini cupcakes. Example three. The final girl raised the chainsaw, its jagged sounds a soothing song of hope to her ears. And here is a macro juxtaposition. Big picture. Edwin grimaced as he saw himself in the mirror as he used to be, downtrodden, sunken-eyed, weak-willed, doing as others commanded without a second thought. Disgusting. With a roar, he wielded his hard-earned sword, shattering the tormenting image, taking his destiny into his own hands once more. So, now we are going to go on to breaking cliches. Use figures of speech that are specific to your world. If they don't have bricks... Don't use the phrase, dense as a brick. If, heaven forbid, they don't have cake, they wouldn't say it was a piece of cake. You can write down cliche turns of phrase in the first draft to get through the story, but then put more thought into them in revision. This may require you to do more world building to see what is common to your characters and build phrases from there. Are some things untranslatable? You might have foreign words that add some spice to your story. So use figures of speech that illustrate more of your character's personality or situation. Sometimes a cliche phrase will not have the desired impact unless expounded upon because our eyes sort of glaze over the words, not really considering their deeper meaning in relation to the character or story because we've seen that phrase so many times. Think about how to make the phrase more visceral and impactful. Here's an example. I hit rock bottom. Here's a way to rephrase. I hit the bedrock of my life's trajectory so hard I entered the subterranean basement and kept on digging. Who knew there was such a thing as self-worth so low it was in the negative? I certainly hadn't. And here's an example on how to expound. I hit rock bottom and clawed my way further down from there. Dirt and debris of broken family ties caked under my fingernails with each uttered word. 
And on to story lengths. You will have much more descriptions in novels versus 100 word drabbles. This does not mean you can skip descriptions altogether. In some drabbles, I don't even know the character's gender. Yet I know what is happening to their face as they freeze to death in the void of space. Focus on what matters. What's important to the story you're telling. Eliminate the superfluous. Make every description earn its keep. Does it increase immersion or bore the reader? So here we're going to talk about uh, what to do for descriptions for a drabble, which is a 100 word story. Only describe what is important to the character. You don't have time for anything else. What is happening in that short moment you are exploring? Pull us in and make us live it with the character. This is a detail of a painting, a close-up. We don't need to know everything, like what type of spaceship it is, who built it, what mission they were on. That doesn't matter to the character in the moment of death and crystallization. This particular example I'm going to share is a human moment that transcends gender and sex, so I didn't even spend time to figure those parts out. Use descriptions that do multiple things at once. Set tone. Illustrate what is happening and our metaphors for the character state. So here is my Drabble spiderweb. A tiny piece of asteroid nicks the visor on my space helmet as I begin repairs to the outside of my ship, floating in the void. A spiderweb of terror cracks into existence over my left eye. The air hisses in a high-pitched scream as it slowly oozes into the vacuum of space, taking my body heat with it. Erratic breathing puffs in clouds, fogging my helmet, its fractals coalescing, blocking out the distant light of stars. My eyes crystallize, daggers of ice delving into my retinas, blinding. Oxygen depletes. Fingers lose their strength, setting me adrift. I am debris. So here we have a spiderweb of terror that cracks into existence. So we have the sound of the crack. We have, we're labeling the emotion as terror, but it's a spider web of terror, so it's a little different. Um, we have the sounds of the hisses as the high-pitched scream. So the vision is getting obscured by the fogging of the helmet, and then they're blinded completely into the darkness, and then they are just debris. Okay, so for flash, which are basically like, 100 to 1,000 word stories. Only describe what is important to the character. You don't have the time or the word count to do the other unimportant stuff. You are exploring a bit longer of a moment. It may be a series of two or three moments in these to add up to 1,000 words. Show us why these moments in particular are worthy of a story of their own. Experiment with prose techniques like anthropomorphism, personification, simile, metaphor, and juxtaposition. These are the perfect times to try and implement them. See if you like them. See if you can switch them around. Just play with it. A flash can only take like 20 minutes, 40 minutes to write. And then you're editing. So just experiment to your heart's content. See what you like. Don't wait for a full-on novel to try and experiment with a literary technique. You won't be able to go back and edit it until like months or years later once you finally finish the draft and are now in the second phase. Make us care enough to keep with the story all the way through. Descriptions should utilize multiple senses. Know a bit of your character's looks and the motive that drives the story. You don't need a story Bible's worth of info for a flash. So here is an example from my piece called Rust. Her hair was the color of rust. So was her skin and nails and the hollowed out sockets where her eyes should have been. Her body flaked and disintegrated, leaving gouges in her once perfect form. My wife. Our laughter once filled this home before they came, before they targeted us with their transmutations, before humanity fell. I hid her body under the floorboards to shield her from the elements, preserving her for as long as possible. A collection of letters, our memories, were stashed with her, collecting her cast-off flakes. She will not be forgotten. This story, in general, is more than 100 words now. So this section is about like 95 words. So we have added more history, more backstory. We are still using the senses, the color of rust, 
but all of her is rust and she's flaking and there's hollowed out sockets and it's all grotesque. Um, we have more emotional connection with the memories being stashed with her before he goes to try and shoot the aliens uh, in time with his heartbeat. <laughs> but yeah, it's great fun to do a little bit more world building with the Flash. So, short stories. So, only describe what is important to the character. Again, you still don't have time for that. You will never have time for that. Just don't do it. You're exploring a short character arc. So, draw us in. Paint the picture of the environment. Utilize the senses. Maybe describe the weather. Is it sympathetic? Raining when your character is crying? Or is it juxtaposition? Where it is bright and sunny and the world keeps turning even though the character is falling apart? Take the time to build up dread or suspense or longing and pining. Know even more about your character. Maybe have a paragraph or two written about their backstory. Maybe cast the main character so you have a photo or portrait for reference. And here is an example from a piece of my short story. The moonlight reflected sharply off the silver buckles and dark vials of the bandolier slung low over the man's torso peeking through the parting of his midnight cloak, tools of the trade. As he entered the cemetery, the dead who yearned to be reborn scratched at their confining coffins. They still had living families to be reunited with. Through the pristine rows of graves he roamed, going further back in time the farther he walked, the fog thickening and crystallizing in his presence, obscuring the long-forgotten names carved in eternal stone. Feral cats cower from his advance, and crickets stilled, abandoning their hymns, Ghostly apparitions fled in fear of being given life again by one who scoffed at celestial law and broke every taboo with malice. Grass died beneath his feet, leaving withered footprints in his wake, an oozing chill emanating from his very being, the byproduct of being frozen in time. So I'm definitely painting more of a picture of the environment. The environment is interacting with him. Uh, the fog is thickening and crystallizing. The grass is dying and freezing beneath his feet. We also have the sound of the bodies in the coffin scratching at the confines. So using all of this can help build up a sense of place and tone and atmosphere. And you have a little bit more time to flesh it out. And the last one is for a novel. Now it's story Bible time. Maybe have Pinterest boards for reference. Paint the picture of the environments, characters, weather. Mix up the senses, utilizing them often. Build up dread and suspense or longing and pining. Don't just paint with broad strokes. Give us fine details of things the characters are proud of or repulsed by. Remember to describe things as the character themselves would. Use that lens. Sprinkle in backstory and history. Maybe utilize flashbacks. And that's it! We did it! So the subtopics were the five senses, the environment affecting the character, filtering through the lens of your character, describing emotions impact on the character's body and mind, anthropomorphism, personification, metaphor, simile, and juxtaposition, breaking cliche phrases, limiting descriptions depending on story length. And now it is time for the Q&A. Ta-da! <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, yes, Pinterest can be a total rabbit hole. Um, yes. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. So I see we have two questions. These are hard questions. Why are you hitting me with the hard stuff? My goodness. Um, how do you catch yourself going too far where would you place these kinds of descriptions? I feel like if you use them too much, you would lose the importance. Um, so I definitely use them in the beginning of introducing things. So I'm trying to set the tone of the story, the promise of the premise, like, is this a spooky story? Is this a love story? Um, with my word choice and how I'm describing the environment. Um, so definitely in the beginning to set the tone and the atmosphere. Uh, usually when it's heightened tension, I will describe how um, the 
environment is reflecting that tension with long sinister fingers of shadows or when uh, in my shelved YA sci-fi, they go and visit a spirit and the spirit comes forward and we get the slash of light across her eyes. So I'm trying to increase the atmosphere to make it more of a spooky scene. Um, so I'm going into the lighting and the temperature and things like that. So anywhere where it could heighten the atmosphere and the mood that you're trying to paint whenever it's changing. Um, so yeah, definitely when you introduce things and I feel like, I think beta reader feedback is a great way to know if you have too much. So they can tell you, like ask them specifically, where do you get bored? And if they mark in the description sections, you know that they're too long and you can start whittling it down. Um, also, do you get bored when you hear it read out loud to you and start skipping through paragraphs? If you're doing that, they're probably too long. Um, so yeah, beta reader feedback is definitely helpful. Also analyze descriptions in books and stories that you love, see how they do it. I have a, a bullet journal where I write out quotes uh, that I can analyze, see what senses they use, how many sentences per description chunk do they use. So analyzing that way can help because every author has a different style and different length. Like Andrea said, oh gosh, Tolkien. Okay, Tol <laughs> Tolkien was a different time. I don't think it would fly nowadays with the amount of descriptions of trees and stuff that he, he has. Um, yeah. So with the length and the pace, I definitely like in my last photograph, I do vignettes with the flashes of the flash bulbs. So um, that helps with the pace. I also have count ups and countdowns that I will utilize sometimes uh, to stretch or shrink the pacing of a, a, a certain scenario. Um, I have a podcast episode that goes over all these literary techniques, but um, yeah. So, oh, Tolkien, I love that stuff, but is it's definitely hard to get through the first time, especially if you haven't seen the movies yet. So you don't know what's coming to keep you invested. So that's one thing is you want these to help invest your reader. If they get bored or you get bored, it's too much. Um, I don't have a hard and fast rule, but definitely don't use all five all the time. That is overkill. Um, let's see. There are more. Okay. <laughs> A world without cake is too horrific. Yeah. Um, I think it's okay if you don't catch all of your cliches, like we're humans, but it definitely is more memorable when you turn a cliche on its head or expound upon it and make it more specific. Um, let's see. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Thank you, Sako. Um, question. Favorite thing you found on the end of Pinterest rabbit hole when following these steps or using them? Pinterest rabbit hole. So, okay. I was reading a, um, whatchamacallit, a writing craft book called Writing in the Dark by Tim Wagner. Highly, highly recommend this book, especially for writing horror. And he had the idea of a reverse cannibal. I was like, I'm going to run with that. So I started drafting reverse cannibal stories. So I have a whole Pinterest based off of like Wendigos and stuff like that. And so just these really cool skeletal creature images that I had that I had for my backdrop of my computer for a while, but I was drafting that. So 
one of my favorites is the images I use to make my anthropophagus backdrop. Um, yes, Gothic and Southern Gothic, they are very descriptive. Um, so those ones definitely take the more time to build the dread and the suspense. So they definitely go into more detail of the wild nature and the candlelight and the ominous castles. And so you can feel the chill oozing from the stonework that the cursed ghost inhabits. So things like that are definitely staples of the Gothic. Um, do you feel these description methods appeal across age groups? Yes. Um, so it's very interesting because I was just reading scary stories to tell in the dark for the first time because I've built up the courage because those illustrations scarred me as a child when I would look through them at the Scholastic Book Fair. And those stories are all telling. There's not much description, but the descriptions that they do have are the ones that will like chill your bones. So those are the the driving factor of what makes them scary is the little descriptions that they plop in there. So um, I think I think that descriptions are useful for multiple aged groups. Just vary the vocabulary based on what the children know. Um, so my middle grade voice is different than my adult horror voice, but yeah. Um, sorry, CB, I don't think I have time to read uh, an excerpt, but um, last question, how much do you put this great stuff in the first drafts and how much do you add in revision or does it just follow out, flow out of you and you have to cut it in revision? It is a combination. So for my drabbles, I usually will draft it in like 10 minutes, 10 minutes to do the 100 words, and then I will read it and read it and read it. And so usually it's fairly descriptive. Usually I start trying to paint a picture in 100 words, and then I will be like, okay, this is too wishy-washy, so what can I cut so I can expand this bit? So it's a whole give and take of two words here, three words there, um, trying to seesaw it into getting the most visual description I can while still having a story that is told. So it flows fairly well out in the first draft, but I've been practicing for a few years um, on descriptions. The book that opened my brain to these descriptive things is The Anatomy of Prose by Sasha Black. It's changed my life. Highly recommend. Um, so this is what the anatomy pros looks like. This is the emotion thesaurus, the second edition, which is the expanded one. And yeah, those two are linked in the description box. They're not affiliate links, but yeah. Um, feedback form will be great. And yes, I do have a link tree where you can read one of my flash pieces called Fairy Godmother, where a girl is haunted by a fairy godmother who will give a wish in exchange for a uh, bone. So fun times, fun times. And yeah, I believe that is it. I will see you guys next time. And yeah, have a great time. Bye.